Good morning. I got this flipped. The, oh, yep. I got this flipped the right way. Might figure this out. Can we give God glory one more time? Y'all are awake, man. The first service, I, I didn't sleep much last night, so I am encouraged. Oh, thank you. I am encouraged to see y'all singing, and I'm like, I get to, what well, uh, Aubrey DeLashman calls them glory bumps, you know, glory bumps. Uh, I hope he don't mind me saying that if he's here. He probably wouldn't care. <laughs> How are y'all doing this morning? I'm excited to be here with y'all. Good morning. Welcome to Central Church. I pray y'all have enjoyed the book of Romans. Amen. I, as it's corrected us, convicted us, encouraged us. Um, it is called the closest systematic theology that we have in the Bible. So it's the closest thing we have to a systematic theology. Before we get started, I don't get to do this much, and none of us really do, but can we honor our pastor with a round of applause? I don't, I don't know if I could do it, brother, without... Uh, what are my shoes untied or something? Okay. I don't know if I can uh, do it like he does it, but he works tireless, tirelessly on the scriptures because I was up till about two in the morning. So I pray that God blesses you through this passage today. All right, let's get started. Last week, Pastor Dustin taught us about the ministry team around Paul. Y'all remember that? All right, I'm quiz you. The main point was... Amen. Pastor's wife gets an A+. Plus. God's family is one big group united for one big goal. We learned a bunch of people who were stout in the apostolic teachings. That is the teachings of Christ. Paul recognized them to the church of Rome, giving them a list of people that should be accepted and trusted into their church. That's a big deal if you get a, on your resume. You know, Paul uh, recommends me. I would like that one if I was getting hired at a church. <laughs> you don't just recommend anyone to the church. They had to be solid people. And Paul shifts his focus here. For a few ver verses and he starts to warn the church what weak or false teachers look like so i'm sorry today is one of those messages i'm not sorry but it's one of those messages that is a little hard to work through i, I picked a a fun one <laughs> so let's play a game and you can talk back to me you can say uh amen hallelujah uh preach it anything like that would be acceptable. But let's play a game. It's called True or False. How many of y'all play True or False? Y'all understand it? All right, it's a pretty straightforward game. I will make a statement, and you will respond with true or false. If you understand, say amen. amen. If you don't understand, just hang tight. You'll catch on, okay? All right, we're going to put them up on the uh, board. A dog sweats by panting its tongue. Oh, False. Canines sweat through their glands in their paws. So, uh, that's not what your mama told you, right? South Africa has one capital. True or false? False. It has three. True or false? Most of the human brain is made of muscle. False. 60% is made of fat. I'm feeling real strong right now. True or false? Dumbo is the shortest Disney film. It's true. It's true. All right, what's the next one? Only two men signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1770. False. Very good. There was only two of them. Uh, wait, oh, hold on. I'm a false teacher right now. I'm sorry. True. Only uh, Charles Thompson and John Hancock signed that day. Over the next month, the other 54 delegates signed the document. All right, true or false? The official color of the Golden Gate Bridge is Tennessee orange. Bom, 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 bom. I'm just kidding. It's international orange, so they can, ships can see it when they're coming into the bay, right? All right, true or false? Dr. Pepper is the oldest soft drink in America. It is true. It was sold first in 1885 out of Waco, Texas. All right, creation took seven days. Oh, we're split. Oh, we're split. It's false. 
It took six days, and on the seventh he rested. Tricked you. Ha, ha, ha. True or false? Uh, David was the last king of Judah. False. It was Zedekiah. And that's in 2 Kings 25, 1 through 7. Um, that's the last one. Nope. True or false? Saul massacred 85 priests in the town of Nazareth. That's false. It was in the town of Nod. But he still massacred 85 priests. Um, now I'm going to get a little serious with y'all. Y'all don't have to answer these questions, but I want y'all to think about them, okay? True or false? A good Christian doesn't do sinful things. True or false, if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, you'll get into heaven. True or false, if I give enough money to the church, God will give me health, wealth, and prosperity. False. These are some y'all just think about. True or false, the faith of my family is enough to save me. I don't need to share the gospel with people. I just have to invite them to church. Pastor, tell them. True or false, speaking in tongues is required to show evidence of the Holy Spirit. So all of this leading up to our main point for this week is, and the title of the sermon is The Truth. I didn't fit that in because I'm not as good a pastor as Dustin, but I'll get there. All believers should know what is true and reject what is false. All believers should know what is true and reject what is false. Today, as we work through the Scripture, my prayer is that we learn what is true and what is not. And if we don't, I pray that we're challenged today to go home and study. I have five things we need to know. The first one is, know the danger. Say it with me. Know the danger. All right. Y'all are awake, man. Let's, let's take a look at verse 17. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught. Avoid them. So it starts out here with an appeal. It says, I appeal to you. Y'all see that? It, to say it in another way, he is urgently asking them, grabbing them by the collar, or these are called lapels, I learned that, by the lapels, pulling them in close and to grab their attention, like, hey, y'all need to pay attention to this. It's not just passive, it's very assertive, and it's something we need to pay attention to. Now let's take a look at the who is being addressed in this manner. Paul is speaking to brothers here. This means he is addressing the fellow believers in the faith at the Church of Rome. This is not a job just for pastors and deacons and leaders, but all believers, everyone in this room that claims the name of Christ, you are to do this. What is it that we are doing? I'm glad you asked. The word watch out means to scope out. How many hunters we got in the room? Probably half the room. Scopeo, to keep your eye on like that turkey, you know. It is where we get our English word telescope. So who is it that we are watching out for? Once again, I'm glad I have my brother in the room. He keeps me humble. I am glad you asked. We are watching out for the person who causes divisions. The person, uh, divisions being... Factions, dividers, strife between people. Have you ever seen, how many of y'all seen the movie Divergent? Some of y'all have, that's okay. So some of y'all understand factions aren't a good thing, are they? They don't work out. Obstacles are stumbling blocks. Stumbling blocks like the thing you did not see, and now you're laid out on the floor. One time I took a step out of my... Uh, the trailer house that Kayla and I had when we first got married, and I went, and I was on my back looking up, right? Let me say it another way. When you're walking through the house in the dark to get your late night snack, because we all do it, don't lie, we're in church, and you discovered the Lego, you don't want to wake the kids up, you discover the Lego or Hot Wheels car that you asked your kid to pick up, not only did it hurt, but you had to check your foot, right? And you had to sit down and check your foot. Unless you're tough-footed like my wife. She walks around barefoot, but 
I won't get into that. I'll get I'll dig a hole I can't get out of. <laughs> I love my wife. She's awesome. Um, so this still applies today, okay? There are many false teachers in the world, arguably more false teachers than true teachers of the gospel. So this is a, a warning. Just test the teacher against the word of God. Me, Dustin, whoever it is, you need to know the word. 1 John 4, 1 says it like this. We must test the spirits to see which teachers are, are excuse me. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are for God, from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets. It doesn't say many true teachers of the word. Unfortunately, it is more false prophets, I think, personally, than there are true teachers of the gospel. So we have a job, church, to know the danger and test all spirits to see whether they are from God or not. So what do they look like, you might ask? Once again, I'm glad you asked. I love that you sit through the first service and you know everything that's coming. So know the fakes. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Know the fakes. The very, the very first word we see here is what? For. If you see this while you're studying, study tip, I learned this this week, uh, you can... Know that this is an explanation of what came before, the sentence before, right? So a helpful tip is to replace that word with because. Avoid them because. So then he gives some descriptions here, and we're going to look deeper into that. The first description, the first descriptions. They are slaves not of Jesus, but of what? Their own appetites. In other words, their own bellies their own lust, their own fleshly desires. They're the kind of people that based on their personalities and charisma, they sway people to believe what they are saying. Man, I wish I picked an easier passage. I'm just kidding. They do not care about you. They do not care about the truth of God's word. Their main goal is to fill their appetite, and their desire is to feel, fulfill their own self, selfish agenda. They are spiritually dead and are powered by evil intentions. We need to apply this today. No part of the Christian life is autonomous. You are either a slave or a servant of Christ, or you're a slave or a servant of to sin. Amen? John 8, 44 says it like this. You are of your father, the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Let's take a look at another verse. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you are children, oh, excuse me, for at one time you were darkness, we were all darkness at one time. But now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and pure. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret." But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, sleeper. 
You may feel free, but that sin that you love will lead to separation from everything that is good. If you hear nothing I say today, hear this. The Lord calls people to Himself, and He desires those who will listen to repent and believe in the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing that God sent His Son to live the perfect life we couldn't, died the death that we deserve, and rose on the third day. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and is coming to judge the living and the dead. Today is the day of salvation, declares the Lord. Let's not wait. Repent and believe. So we need to apply this today. Somehow my notes got messed up there. But. So let's jump down to the second description. The second description. These people are divisive a stumbling block to others. They serve only themselves. The Scripture describes their talk as smooth. You know anybody that's a smooth talker? It's not me. I'm not a smooth talker, but some people are. Smooth means, uh, in this passage, winsome, attractive, appealing. It looks really good. You would, in the, uh, the word for flattery there, the original word here means eulogy you will probably speak highly of this person you don't go to a funeral and they're like oh so and so is a bad person no they they speak highly of that person you would probably have them over for dinner not knowing that it is a wolf in sheep's clothing and the intention of these the third description is the intention of these people is to deceive 2 Corinthians 11.13 says, For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles for Christ. They may need, know, even know Bible words and some theology, disguising themselves to fool you. They may stand behind pulpits or lecterns and appear to be true, but in reality they are false teachers. It's all about them. It's never, it might look and sound good, but it's all about them. And they use all of these attributes to prey on the naive. Who are the naive? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the naive in this text are those who are Bible illiterate. We all start out here. I'm the guiltiest. Uh, but some never moved towards Bible literacy. I remember the first time I sat down and thought I knew a thing or two about the Bible. I met for a study on hermeneutics. If you know what that is, it's just three steps of studying the Scripture. And if you've been through her hermeneutics, you know the first step is observation. Observation. Well, I sat down to give my observations of the text, and I learned quickly that ignorance is not a virtue. Shane Hartfield said I can put his name next to that one because he told me ignorance is not a vir virtue and you can put my name next to that one. I started to read the test that I was tasked of giving an observation on and I quickly jumped over observation and tried to apply it to myself. This is dangerous. Oh man, sound guy's going to be mad at me. I'm moving my microphone. This is a dangerous habit, habit that takes away from the author's original intended meaning to the original intended audience. Got a couple exam examples. Have you heard, be David and slay your Goliath? You're not David, and you don't really have a Goliath. You might be going through things, but people take this passage out of context. Who is the hero of the story in David and Goliath? God is the hero. Y'all are smart, man. I can't believe I'm up here talking to y'all. I'm just kidding. Or just praise the Lord and your Jericho walls will come down. I think they had a task to blow a trumpet or something like that. And then they had to shout on a certain time of marching around the city. But a lot of people take that out of context and apply it directly to themselves. We have to be careful and honor the author's original intended meaning. Second 
So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. So this is how God speaks to us and increases our faith. Through his word. Let's move to the next point. Know the truth. Know the truth. Verse 19, for your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Notice here that Paul is commending the church of Rome for their obedience, not their righteousness, not their casseroles or their donations to the church. God wants his people to make the next right step of obedience. Share the good news of Jesus. As Pastor Dustin said last week, let every dollar you spend and anything you do revolve around the gospel. Every decision you make, even leaving here today, let it revolve around the gospel. Another thing we see in this verse... Uh-oh. is the church of Rome has a target on their back. Because of this obedience, Paul says your obedience is known to all, right? We all know that if a church is doing well, the enemy is on the attack. The attacks might not yet have started in the church of Rome, but they most definitely are coming. Satan hates you. He hates your marriage. He hates your family. And he hates this church. It is his desire to weasel his way up into anything that is glorifying God and plant his lies to hinder the work that God is doing there. Next, Paul says he wants the church to have discernment. The church needs to be able to detect the truth from falsehood, right? He says, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. If they are wise, then they are knowledgeable. What is the good that Paul is referring to here? It is good doctrine and sound theology. Then he says to be innocent. Innocent means to be pure and unmixed. You ever try to mix oil and water? That's what we are to be with this knowing that it is the work of the Holy Spirit, or the evil thing is the false teaching, and knowing that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to unify a group of believers, and we need to pray for unity and be ready when the enemy puts his sights on us. That's our task, church. So we're we're getting close. For the fourth point is know the gospel. (laughs) Know the gospel. Verse 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is a promise given to us all the way back in Genesis. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The bruise was Jesus being crucified on the cross. We know that's not the end of the story, but we need to know the bad news before we can appreciate the good news. Being that Romans is called the closest thing to systematic theology we have, let me share with y'all what is called the Roman road. How many of y'all have heard of it? Let's take a walk down the Roman road. The first verse is Romans 3.10. None is righteous, no, not one. Not your sweet Mima, not your grandma. Nobody is righteous. We all fall short. That leads to the next one. Write these verses down if you can. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short, fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned since Adam. The third verse is Romans 5, 8, and it's one of my favorites. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 12, 
Therefore, just as sin came through into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages is something you earn. And unfortunately, our sin pays nothing but death. But, got to love the buts in the Bible. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10, 9 through 11. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And finally, the last verse is uh, Romans ten thirteen. For everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Amens fit perfectly when it comes to reading just Scripture. Romans Road lays out the plan of salvation through a series of Bible verses from the book of Romans. When arranged in order, these verses form an easy, systematic way of explaining the message of salvation. There are many different versions of the Roman Road with slight variations in Scripture, but the basic message and method is the same. Many evangelical missionaries, evangelists, and lay people memorize and use the Roman road when sharing the good news. This is a tool y'all as a church can use to know the gospel and share the gospel. Also, I don't want to miss this point we get from there. There is a great promise to proclaim in that passage. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. There is a day coming soon when as believers we will no longer have to worry about fake teaching. What a day that will be. That this fallen state won't last forever. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. My next point ties back to what we learned last week. So let's take a look at the people who stayed there with Paul and didn't go to the didn't go to Rome with these folks that were in verses 1 through 16. So what's the next point? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Know your team. Know your team. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So, so do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greets you in the Lord, Gaius, who is the host to me, and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus, greets you. Paul shifts his focus again here in Paul fashion and starts to talk more about his ministry team. The first person is Timothy. He was a right-hand man and a fellow worker. Second is Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, relatives who were believers, Three was Tertius, a humble helper. Paul wrote this letter uh, by speaking it to Tertius, is what it's believed. Gaius, a man of hospitality. Erastus, a civil servant, the city treasurer, who's probably in some office. And Cortus, a Christian brother. What we need to take away from this is we all need Jesus-loving, gospel-sharing people to help fulfill the ministry. They need to be like-minded people that believe the same thing you do, not your unbelieving cousin who is still worldly. You can share the gospel with him, but I probably wouldn't spend a whole lot of time rubbing elbows, right? If you want to be encouraged, surround yourself with people that are encouraging. That's one of my favorite things to do. It's called exhortations. Exhortation is to encourage, to uplift. Barnabas was called son of encouragement if you want to have a godly marriage find a couple that will set the example look around 
Be with those people. If you want a godly family, look for somebody that is setting the example and be with those people. So we've made it. Some application as we close is watch out for false teachers. Watch out for false teachers. I was convicted by this message this week to not believe necessarily everything that I'm being taught and I need to test it against the Word of God. Amen? I hope y'all feel the same way. Don't be naive. Learn the Bible. Bible literacy is, I think, the best thing to combat fake teaching. Surround yourself with true people that will help you, encourage you, set an example, and believe the true gospel. If you've not done that, today is the day of salvation, declares the Lord. Don't walk out of here questioning your salvation. Write it down on a card. Talk to Dustin or I or anybody in this room. Let them know you have a question and we can talk about this today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time we've got together to worship you. Lord, I praise you for all the voices that lift you up in this room. Lord, I pray that you would... If, I pray for that one in this room who has not repented and believed in the gospel. I pray that you will illuminate their hearts, open their eyes, God, to see you for who you are and what you have done on the cross for us. Knowing that it's not a special prayer that you pray, but just coming to the end of yourself and knowing that you need Jesus, repenting of your sins, turning away from your sins, and turning to life towards Christ Lord I pray for the believers in this room as we work through this message that they would apply it to their lives that they would pay attention to teachers that may not say uh, the truth Lord I pray that you would be glorified through the message this day put people in our lives that we can share the gospel with pray this in Jesus name Amen